Thank you very much for the invitation to give this plenary talk. It's an honor and a pleasure to speak about the work that my group and I have been doing in the area of safe learning in robotics. And I think as a, a general theme um, in the work that we're doing, the, the idea is, um, is to think about how we can use information inherent to the systems at hand, such as mathematical models of the dynamics and constraints of a system, um, predictive models of the behavior of the system to enable learning-based control, especially in safety critical scenarios. Um, and, um, and I'm going to present this work through um, like a, a little bit of the background in control theory, which is my area, and then through a number of examples. I, I'd like to start just by giving a, a few motivational examples. And, and uh, these images are images of um, a vehicle, a flying vehicle that a company in the San Francisco Bay Area Actually, these are two companies in the San Francisco Bay Area, Skydio and Neuro. They both make um, vehicles, one's an air vehicle, one's a ground delivery vehicle for, um, for motion and um, video capture and um, delivery. And in particular, these vehicles have to operate in unstructured environments. So they're um, taking information about the world around them from their cameras and other sensors and using that to uh, control the vehicle safely in these environments. So, so I chose these two companies because um, some of my graduate students have had internships at these companies and um, have come away from this is a really positive experience um, as we think about learning based control, especially for vehicles um, operating around people. So in a safety critical scenario. So in terms of the talk today, I've broken it into two pieces. The first piece is, um, is kind of as I spoke about at the beginning, how can we use uh, dynamics models and constraints, um, information that we have about a system in order to, and, and then um, control techniques to be able to develop control systems to allow the system to operate safely in, um, in environments in which you know most about, uh, like most about what's going on around you. And then in the second part of the talk, um, we're going to start incorporating these ideas from perceiving the environment. So you don't know that much about the environment or you, you're learning about the environment and you'd still like to be able to operate safely in that environment. So the kind of idea of safety-based control and then how to incorporate data and machine learning methods into safety-based control. So the, for the first part of the talk, I'm gonna present a tool, a methodology that my research group has been working on for um, a long time now. Um, the concept of reachability, computing a reachable set, what it is and how you can use it in safety-based control. And then, um, and then we'll move on to learning-based methods. Um, the, the kind of research edge at the first part. So these are tools, as I said, that we've been working on for a long time. Um, and the key, as you might expect to these techniques is efficient computation. And so that a lot of the research that we've been doing in my group has focused around efficient computation. Um, and in the second part, we'll focus on the data-driven aspects of incorporating learned information safely. Okay, so the concept of reachability, I'm gonna present it in a, a kind of stylistic way. Um, it centers around the idea of computing a reachable set of a system. Um, you could, you could um, have a set of initial conditions, initial states of a system and compute its forward reachable set. So the, the kind of conditions that the system will get into over or could get into over a specific time horizon or you could, um, you could do kind of the reverse. Think about a set of situations or states that you'd like the system to get to, or as I've kind of tried to picture here, a set of states which might represent an unsafe condition for the system, and you'd like to protect the system from reaching those states. So for that um, kind of following this example, I'm gonna present the idea of a backwards reachable set. Okay, so this is um, a set of all states, all configurations of a system for which 
for all possible control actions that you as the controller or an autopilot or an autonomous control system, for all possible uh, control actions, there is a disturbance action which could drive the system to those unsafe conditions over a particular time horizon. So in this picture here, this unsafe condition, we call it the set G at time zero, G at zero. So that's that red ellipse here. I'm assuming for now we have some dynamic model. It's given to us, we, we've identified it and we know it. And this is um, um, you know, a differential equation. It could be a difference equation. It could be a finite state machine, any kind of dynamic model in which the state of the system is the vector X, the control input is the vector U, and the vector D is, um, it could represent a set of disturbance actions, um, actions that can affect the system that the controller has no control over. Um, we typically assume that we, um, we don't know the value of D, but we have some um, knowledge of the set that D could lie within. So D takes, the vector D takes values from a given set. Um, and so the backwards reachable set is this set, you know, in, in, this, in this image here, the set that's kind of this pink set G at time T. So the set of all states for which, for all possible control actions, there is a disturbance action which could drive the system to this set G at time zero in T time units. And we'll call that set G at time T. So it's this, it's this, this um, under the dynamics of the system, a state that's in this region could get um, into this set G of zero in a time horizon T. We pose this reachability problem, this computation of this reachable set as a game with this idea of a control action that, that you as the controller or the autopilot, whatever could, could affect playing against a disturbance action where the disturbance is attempting to force the system into the unsafe region. Now, it may not be doing that in real life, but from a conservative point of view, we're going to assume that the disturbance could play its worst case action in order at x at time t, and then throughout that time horizon up to time zero, so think of t as some negative number now, where um, the disturbance could be trying to always force the system to get into G at zero and the control action can play against that. It can do its best to try to overcome the actions of the disturbance. So that's the setup. Now, in terms of computing the reachable set, this is work that, that um, it's, it's kind of a long history of, um, of this um, problem in the control and game theory community. Um, and, uh, and we and others have worked on this, um, but we proved that the set G of T can be computed as the sub-zero level set, so what, that's what this first line says, the sub-zero level sets of a function J, where that function J, this is a value function, satisfies this equation. This is a form of what's called a hamilton jacobi isaacs equation. And it's, a, it's um, a fairly standard and very popular and very powerful equation in optimal control and reinforcement learning. Um, and this is a variant on that, where on the right-hand side of the differential equation, there's this min with zero operator that basically um, uh, allows one to compute this can you get into this set in any time along that time horizon? So, so if a state, for example, um, you know, starts out outside the set, it goes through that set and it comes out the other side in that time horizon T time units, then that condition, that state would still be recorded as unsafe, even though it got out of the set. So we want to make sure that if you get into the set, then that's an unsafe condition and the computation captures that. Okay, so um, many of you know that this uh, solving this equation is a challenge. Um, we're faced with the curse of dimensionality, um, basically because for um, the state vector, for high dimensional state vectors, um, we're, um, we're faced with um, a great deal of computation because this equation requires in general, 
gridding up the state space, so gridding up the, the, the state dimension, uh, the state space X, and, um, and then solving this equation at each grid point. And since there's a, there's a, 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 a derivative of J with respect to the state space, a derivative of J with respect to time, we're computing those derivatives numerically. Okay, so, so a lot of what we've been doing in my lab is focused on computation, as I said earlier, and I'm gonna say a few words about that in this first part of the talk. Um, so this is sort of stylistically representing, we start at that unsafe condition and then we work backwards, iteratively computing that set over time. Um, if that set um, kind of closes off over time, so you know, even though you may compute for longer than t time units, that set doesn't grow anymore, we call that set controlled invariant and we can say a little more about this. Um, but first of all, the, if, if we think a little more stylistically about this, um, the sub-zero level sets of this value function j, what does that mean? So this set is represented implicitly through this function j of xt. So I've, I've kind of taken a slice of this um, stylistic representation of that set here. And I've shown a side view of that slice down below. So in terms of the initial set, the initial function j of xt could look like this. So it's sub zero level sets are represented by you know, this region here. And then as, that, um, as we continue to compute that hamilton jacobi isaacs equation, that function j of xt is changing over space and time. So at a snapshot at time t, if we look again at that slice, it may look something like this, like this, this uh, combination of the of the original set and then this dashed line. Again, we're capturing the sub-zero level sets of that function. So there's, a, um, there's an efficiency in that by representing sets in term, implicitly in terms of this value function, then we can capture you know, non-convex sets. We can capture sets that are disconnected um, that satisfy this property of, um, of being able to capture those states which could enter the unsafe set in that time horizon. Um, and if that set is controlled invariant for all t, so like I said earlier, if that set closes off and it doesn't grow anymore, then any super zero level set, that means um, a level which is greater than zero, now we're looking at a super zero level set here, that set is also invariant and can be used for safety. Because the idea is that if you, as the, um, as the control designer, if you're at a state here in the blue region, if you can stay outside of this over uh, representation of that set, of this super zero level set, then you can stay outside of the zero level set. Um, and so we could use you know, super zero level sets. We'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about learning. And then the other point to raise here, which is important for learning, is that if the more you know about the system model, namely what's not known here, as I said before, is the disturbance model. So the more you know about the disturbance, the less conservative these sets become. So for example, if you um, didn't know very much about the disturbance, you may be protecting against quite a large set, but then as that disturbance becomes, um, as, as you learn or potentially gather information about that disturbance and learn more about the set that it's bounded in, so you can make that set smaller, um, the, um, the actual range of the disturbance or its action becomes um, more, it becomes less conservative and that comes through in the representation of the set. So that automatically comes out of this computation. And if we were to know the disturbance, then the optimal, in this case, the smallest reachable set could be computed. Um, okay, numerical computation. So this is the big deal. And, and a lot of the, um, actually my, my first PhD student, Ian Mitchell, who's now um, in the computer science department at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, um, he developed a, um, what's called, we call a level set toolbox for computing reachable sets. This is um, a set of codes which, as I am um, alluded to earlier, it um, thinks very carefully, or he thinks very carefully in terms of computing this um, 
uh, developing this tool in how to perform these numerical differentiation operators over space and time of the value function. And he's building on um, kind of a wealth of knowledge coming from a, a community in mathematics and scientific computation that do level set coding. Um, these are based on the work of Stanley Osher at UCLA, Jamie Sethian at Berkeley, John Sisiklis at MIT. They're all kind of pioneers of these level set methods for computing, um, uh, for propagating partial differential equations. And what Ian Mitchell did was to take these ideas and develop a code for these Hamilton Jacobi Isaacs in the case of games and Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equations in the case of control. Okay, so, so the numerical computation is to create this level set function J. This is our value function that we're solving for. Um, and it solves the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. In, in that, it means that the um, the boundary of the region is defined implicitly by the zero level set. So that's the, the, the boundary in this example here are all states X um, at time T such that J of X T is equal to zero. Um, the magnitude of J at any point X at time T is the distance. So for example, if you're, let's look at this picture here, you can see it more clearly in terms of the sub-zero level sets. At a state X at time T, the magnitude of J gives you the distance to the boundary. If you're using um, a distance, some distance-like function to represent J. So perhaps a sine distance function, for example, as is shown here. And then um, J is negative inside the region and positive outside. So, so that's actually information that's really useful for control. Because as um, if you have access to a function like this and you're controlling a system, then you can capture how far you are away from violating a safety condition. Assuming that you have a model of the system up to the disturbance, and assuming also that that other part of the problem we had, that you've got a representation of what it means to be unsafe, that G at time zero, and that can be represented as a region in the system state space. Okay, so in that respect, this is a very general tool, this idea of reachability. Um, oh, I wanted to say one more word on that slide before going to example one. Um, the code is available uh, through a couple of different links we have here. The first link is a link to the original level set toolbox, which is a link on Ian's uh, UBC website. The second link is a link to our lab's GitHub uh, reachability site, where um, we've developed a number of other tools, um, in particular a wrapper, which is called Helper OC, which is a, um, a wrapper that you can use um, that calls the reach of the level set toolbox, but it's um, it gives you a nice interface for entering your own dynamics of the system, um, uh, entering, for example, the you know the the right hand side of that uh, PDE is called the Hamiltonian, so you can enter that information. It gives you more guidance about that. The second link, um, this this link, which is called vehicles, this is um, a newer level set. Um, uh, code that we've developed within our group that um, uh, works, uh, it's um, applied on um, a parallel processing format, so it can be used in particular for higher dimensional problems. And I'm just going to say a few more words about that in a second. Okay, example one. So this is a nice illustration for a, you know, kind of a fun experiment that we did several years ago. This is actually a, a field at Stanford. So I used to be a professor at Stanford and we'd fly these. These are quad rotors that we built ourselves back, um, again, this was several years ago. Um, but um, a couple of things here. There are four quad rotors flying around and there are four students sitting over here. Each student has a joystick which is controlling one quad rotor. The quad rotors are manually controlled, except each has an autopilot on board which will automatically kick in when their vehicle comes within the reachable set distance for collision avoidance with respect to any of the three other vehicles. Okay, so um, there's a snapshot of the data on the right here. You see the four vehicles, and then around each vehicle, we've got a collision zone. That's just that disk. 
And then there's three other sets. Each of those sets represents its backwards reachable set with respect to one of the other vehicles. So if one of the vehicles comes to and touches the boundary of the reachable set that's associated with that particular pair of vehicles, then the autopilot will automatically take over and guide the autopilot of the, the vehicle at risk will automatically take over and guide the vehicle away from that reachable set. And when it's at a particular distance away from the boundary of that reachable set, will give control back to the human. So it's, a, um, it's kind of like a, a protective shield that you can't see, but it's, a, it's a, like a boundary in space that's dynamically moving as the vehicles are changing with respect to each other. And with that boundary comes the particular control action from the Hamilton Jacobi calculation that you can apply or that the autopilot can apply to guide the vehicles away from each other. Okay, so this is a particular example where for those four vehicles, when we consider that four vehicle problem, it gets to be a high dimensional problem as you, as you um, um, basically, you know, group all those, the states of each vehicle together. But this is a problem where the, um, the collision avoidance function can be decomposed so that you can decompose this four vehicle collision avoidance problem into um, these different pairs of collision avoidance problems. And that's particular to this example because these quadrotors can kind of stop in place. They can hover in one place. It doesn't always hold, and we'll come back to that. Okay, um, now that we've shown about avoiding a particular set, and we've shown an example of that, we can also turn the problem around and talk about capture regions. So this technology can be used for the opposite problem, which we, um, we often wanna do, right? Capturing a desired condition. That means um, computing the control law um, which or compute determining whether or not there exists a control law such that for all possible disturbances, the system gets to a desired region. And the backwards reachable set then is called this capture basin, the set of states for which for all possible disturbances, there's a control which can get the system to that desired region. It's the same hamilton jacobi isaacs equation, um, but for, um, for those of you who are kind of watching carefully, the, uh, the order of the min-max operator here and you know, what's, what's minimized and what's maximized has changed. So now the control is minimizing this, um, this inner product between the gradient of J and the dynamics, whereas the disturbance is assumed to maximize it. As the disturbance is, you know, we don't know what it's gonna do, so we're going to assume it's going to do its worst to push the system away from the desired condition, whereas the control is trying to get the system into the desired condition. Okay, so um, we talked about reachable sets. We talked about avoiding unsafe sets. We've talked about capturing desired sets or getting to desired sets. We talked about the representation of the set. We've talked a little bit about, you know, what's involved in computing it. And we've given an example. So now let's kind of combine these together um, and talk a little bit about the, the idea of computing and the challenges there of um, dealing with this curse of dimensionality. And this is a very active research area. This is an area when we think about um, these reachability properties, it falls within, you know, within control. We use, we use as I've told you, the tools of optimal control and differential games um, to, uh, to compute these sets. Um, but it exists, you know, in other communities. So in computer-aided verification, the idea of um, uh, computing a set of states which guarantees, is guarant from which you can guarantee that a certain specification holds, that's called a model checking um, methodology. And so there's, there's kind of this communities across control and computer-aided verification that have done a lot of work in developing tools for reachability, for model checking. And I've categorized them roughly into, you know, how do people deal with high dimensional states? Um, I think the most engineering, the most practical thing that's done, and this is what you see in real life, is that we control the cursor of dimensionality by imposing practical constraints 
to decouple or to, well, decouple or decompose large dimensional state spaces into their smaller groups. So we impose practical constraints in vehicle systems, right? We, we develop roads or highways. So you're only dealing with, um, you know, you're dealing in a very organized way with vehicles both in front and behind you. And then there's a protocol for changing lanes. That's also, you know, although it's it's very different in air traffic control, which is an area that I've worked a lot in, there are these highways in the sky that air traffic controllers route aircraft along. So there's a there's an organization to problems so that you don't get you know tons of vehicles coming into a close vicinity of each other at any given time. So protocols. Um, there's also approximations that are done, and these approximations can be. Um, on the dynamics of the system, um, or they could be on and or they could be on the representation of the specification of the constraint set, for example. So in our problem, if the dynamics were linear and the constraints were quadratic, that Hamilton Jacobi Isaacs equation becomes a Riccati equation and there's analytic solutions that are possible. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of approximations, you see these sort of linear approximations of dynamics. Um, um, so there's a, a number of groups that have worked on polyhedral sets or ellipsoidal sets. So instead of thinking more generally about a level set function um, that can capture general sets, what are the savings if we do, um, if we do a prop? over approximate these unsafe sets, for example, with polyhedral sets or ellipsoidal sets. Can we get some computational savings? And people have shown that. Um, going on to the mathematical structure of the problem, if the differential equation is monotone, um, which means um, roughly that the relationships between the state variables in terms of their precedence are maintained over time then um, computation, there's, there's some computational savings that can occur. Um, we've done some work on decompositions, how to take a general high dimensional ordinary differential equation model of a system and decompose it into overlapping subsystems, do the reachable set computation in the subsystems and then um, redevelop or, or um, from that develop either an over approximation or an exact representation of the reachable set. I'm going to talk a little bit, give an example about um, each of the last two on this list. Um, how we might do some of this computation offline ahead of time and then use those structures in real time. And then also how we might use machine learning methods to move away from the kind of constraints of grid based computation for these high dimensional sets. So first of all, exploiting offline computation. And this kind of leads to the next set of examples. Um, so this, this idea um, has, um, it's, it's kind of an idea which um, it combines ideas from control and robot motion planning. On the left-hand column is the kind of idea of what, as a control theorist, we might do for trajectory planning for a quadrotor. And I've written the, I've sort of um, represented the quadrotor here as its full, you know, high dimensional, maybe, you know, our high dimensional models that we typically use are 12 dimensional models of the quadrotor. So that's, you know, the positions, the orientations and their, um, uh, and their derivatives. So the, the velocities and the angular velocities of the vehicle. So a 12 dimensional model, we use optimal control. We generate trajectories to avoid these constraints. Um, and it's great uh, if we have a model of the vehicle, which we do, um, and a model of the constraints, which we, we could have, um, but it's slow to compute, you know, computing a trajectory for a 12 dimensional model and then updating every time a new constraint comes in is slow. Um, on the other hand, on the right hand side column is kind of a representation of what's done in robot motion planning. You don't use a high dimensional model of the system, just use something simple, maybe even just like, you know, in this case, it might be a 3D point mass. Um, and, uh, you know, think about um, uh, possible points that the vehicle could go to, which are collision free, and connect, connect those with straight lines. So very fast, can replan very quickly. However, that when you try to track that trajectory with the accurate model or with the actual system, 
it may violate the constraints because the dynamics, um, you know, the turning dynamics, whatever, aren't considered in that model. So we propose this center column, um, fast and safe planning, where we pre-compute ahead of time. So pre-compute a tracking error bound between a high dimensional model of the vehicle and a low dimensional model that could be used for fast planning. So that tracking error bound, which is this bound which we've depicted around this point here, is a bound that it, it basically says that, you know, if the planning model is at this particular point here, the, the state of the planning model, then as long as the state of the high dimensional vehicle, so the track, let's call it the tracking model, this vehicle here, is inside that bound at all points, then there's a control that guarantees that that state can reach that tracking bound. So that gives you basically a bound around the fast planning state. And that tracking error bound, computing that ahead of time is a reachability problem. So the idea is that we're not only using the control available to us to follow the plan, but when we're on the border of violating this tracking error bound, we're using the control to keep us back in that tracking error bound. So um, I think I'm, I've described this slide um, in the previous, but but let me just go through the animation here. Here, the um, we've got, in this case, we're looking at a, um, a four-dimensional tracking model for a two-dimensional planning model. So it's not that big a difference between the two. And the relative dynamics between that four and two-dimensional model is a four-dimensional model. And we, um, we, we look at the reachable set, so the tracking error bound computation, for three different bounds. This is um, a one meter bound, this is a 0.75 meter bound and a 0.5 meter bound. And then we compute the reachable set. So let's, let's do that here. So that's sort of done simultaneously in the representations. And you see this reachable set being co computed. Um, if there's any volume left in those bounds, that indicates that that is a region in which that relative model can always stay within this region here. So this is a backwards reachable set inside that bound. And this shows that, you know, there's no volume inside the 0.5 meter bound. So there are no states for which you're guaranteed that that four dimensional model will stay within 0.5 meters of the two dimensional model. But for 0.75 and one um, meter, there is volume inside that. And, and you don't only get the set that you have to stay within, but as part of that hamilton jacobi reachable set calculation, you get the control to keep you inside. So we've used that um, in a number of different problems in real time tracking. So we've pre-computed these tracking error bounds, and then we've used that in real time motion planning for robots. And one of the, I think one of the nicest problems we worked on in this respect, and it comes back to kind of one of the central themes of this conference and that I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, thinking about predictive models of behavior is, um, is what happens when we have robots that are operating around people and we'd like the robots to be able to plan actions even while people are moving around. So this is work that we did um, in collaboration with my colleague, Professor Anka Dragan at Berkeley. And um, for this work, we, as the kind of the development of a planning algorithm for the, the robot, in this case, the quadrotor, we're using, um, the quadrotor is using a fairly popular now model that is used for uh, predicting or representing and then predicting future behaviors of um, people moving in the environment. This is a Boltzmann model. It's a Boltzmann model kind of coming from physics. And it says that um, the probability, um, let me just get my cursor back here, it keeps disappearing. The probability of a particular action of the human, so this human is moving um, you know, around in the environment and has possible directions it can go represented by UH, 
is proportional to a function which kind of describes the efficiency of that action with respect to a value function that that human has, which is parameterized by goals that the human might have in the environment. So this Q function is parameterized by theta, where theta is a vector representing possible um, goals of the person. And so in this, in this um, scenario, there's a person moving around in the environment and there could be you know, possible goals that that person is going to. The quadrator is watching what the person is doing and based on their actions is trying to infer based on the possible goals, what are the most likely next few steps of the person. So here in the simple scenario, there's a door and that's our only goal that we're viewing in this scenario. And the regions of high probability are those next steps which are leading the person directly to the door. So it's more likely for the person to follow the control action that gets the person closer to the door. And that's the idea. So this is a, a model that's been, um, been used quite a lot. It falls in this uh, area of rational action models of human behavior. And, um, and there's a parameter, this beta, this inverse temperature coefficient from the Boltzmann model, which can be tuned based on the, the person's actions. So, um, so let me just show you a, an example here that we ran. Um, this is Sylvia and Jaime. These are two former students. Sylvia is now a professor at UCSD and Jaime is a professor at Princeton. And they are our pedestrians. There's um, two of them moving across the room. Sylvia wants to get to this side of the lab, Jaime to this side of the lab. And there are two quad rotors, one, two. They're both observing uh, Sylvia and Jaime's actions and using this Boltzmann model representation, one for each of Sylvia and Jaime, they're computing the regions that um, Sylvia and Jaime are most likely to be in for the next few steps, and then planning paths using our fast and safe planning algorithm to avoid those. So let's run this example so you can see the outcome. So first we'll just run it taking a look at Jaime and Sylvia. Um, so we initialize the quad rotors, then Jaime and Sylvia start moving. Jaime is moving in a little bit of a maybe irrational way. He's dancing a little bit, um, going a little bit slower than Sylvia. And they both kind of came to the center and had to avoid each other. So let's go back and look at the top down view in terms of um, Sylvia and Jaime and the regions around them represented by this Boltzmann model that the quad rotors are computing in real time of their next steps, their likely next steps. So now we'll focus on the top down view. And you see that um, as this starts to go, so here's Sylvia, here's Jaime, immediately the region around Jaime is much bigger. That, that's sort of his dancing and the motion is he's a little bit more uncertain. Um, so that's reflected in um, an online update of this beta parameter. The beta parameter for Jaime is updated. So his probability distribution according to that Boltzmann model spreads out a little bit. And then when they, um, when they get to the center of the room, they're probably, they stop a little bit to avoid each other. So again, their probabilities spread out, their probabilities of where they're gonna be in the next few steps spread out a little bit. And so they, um, the, this kind of model naturally captures this interaction between the two people without actually you know, having that encoded in the model of what the people are doing. Um, okay, one more word about computation and that's um, based on machine learning methods. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've been doing lately with uh, Samuel Bansal, a uh, former PhD student in my lab now. He's an assistant professor at USC. Um, okay, so we talked about computing hamilton jacobi functions, grid-based methods, cursive dimensionality. Can we get away from grid-based methods? And lately with, um, with uh, deep learning based methods for computing scientific problems, there's an opportunity to do that. So we developed a tool which is called DeepReach, which is a method for um, supervised learning of the value function um, with only the information of the value function itself. Okay, so the Hamilton-Jacobi-Isaacs PDE 
becomes the loss function. So the basically, you know, this PDE, this left-hand side should be zero. That's the definition of the PDE. So the, um, you know, for any particular instantiation of parameters in our value function, um, so we'll call the parameterization of VV theta, where theta represents the, the parameters of the function representing V. Um, if that left-hand side of the PDE is not zero, that becomes a PDE violation error, which we can use as a loss function in training a neural network to compute V. And that's the idea. So you randomly sample a state and time, compute the loss function. And here we're including not only the PDE, but also the initial state. This L of X represents our set G at time zero, the data that we're given about the constraints. Um, use that to update the parameters and repeat. Okay, so this is a cycle where we're representing the value function as a neural net. We're learning a parameterized approximation of the value function. Um, and typically, um, the neural net parameters theta are obtained by supervised learning, where the value function is assumed to be known at some states. But however, the idea here is that obtaining this value function, these, these value function samples is hard, especially in high dimensional systems. So we use this loss function as a self-supervised learning method. Um, the PDE itself is the source of supervision. And, um, and the key thing here is that basically how do we, like what kind of neural net do we use? Um, we're interested as we talked about before in um, gradients, both like in space and time of the value function. Uh, if we were to use something like ReLU, then the gradients, you know, are, they, they can't represent the value function well. So we built a deep reach based on a tool that came out last year um, uh, called Siren for sinusoidal representation networks. Use sinusoids as the, um, as the, as the neuron functions in the neural network. They have um, both a representation of the value function and their gradients. And so we can not only compute the value function well, but we can obtain both the, you know, the optimal control and the worst disturbance from the gradients of the value function. Okay, so DeepReach is a sinusoidal representation network where we're using um, a self-supervised method via the loss, a loss function, which is from the mathematical representation of the PDE itself to solve the solution of the PDE. Um, and it turns out that this method, um, it's, it's a paper that we presented earlier this spring in ICRA, but it's, um, we've been working on a number of examples. So for ex example, this three aircraft collision avoidance problem. So there's three three-dimensional aircraft. They're just moving in the plane, so at constant altitude. Uh, this is an example, nine dimensions, that we haven't been able to compute directly using Hamilton-Jacobi methods because the dimension is too high. Uh, when we talk about you know, getting a realistic grid for each of those dimensions. And here with deep reach, we're able to get a, um, uh, a, a more accurate solution than we're, we were able to get with any of the approximation methods than, that we've used before. Um, and we've also developed, this is a 10 dimensional, so each vehicle is a two dimensional car and it's a 10 dimensional collision avoidance problem that we can solve directly with deep reach. And we've solved um, 12 and now 16 dimensional problems with deep reach. So there's a lot to be done here. And these are just examples. There's, again, it's a numerical method for computing. So there's no guarantees, but that's what we're working on, trying to understand how we can get you know, what we're observing is that for the low dimensional problems, we get a more accurate representation using deep reach. Of course, you know, there's a lot of hyperparameters that we need to study. Then we've been able to get using grid-based methods. And I think this is a very exciting direction to use learning for, right? Deep learning methods for computing solutions to mathematical problems that we, we haven't been able to do before. Okay, so with that, I'd like to spend the last few minutes of the talk, um, and I've got, you know, I'm just skipping through this example of the 10-dimensional problem. 
Okay, so we see that. But I'd like to um, I'd like to just go to this uh, incorporating machine learning. So it's kind of we've already incorporated machine learning in our or learning based methods in our update of the Boltzmann model in that example you saw of fast and safe tracking. We're using deep learning directly in this computation method for solving for reachability. Now, how do we go back to the problem that I presented at the beginning um, on systems that perceive their environment and um, through learning-based perception, get a representation of what's in the environment. How do we blend that with the kind of safety-based control that we have using reachability methods? And so this last section, which I'll, I'll really just present a few examples is called learning dynamic behavior safely. Um, so I'll, I'll, as I said, I'll introduce this via examples. Um, and, and this, um, this, uh, this, this second to last example is one that was a kind of motivation for us. It's a very simple learning scheme and it's kind of a contrived example where all we're asking the quad rotor to do here is to just follow a step trajectory up and down in our lab. So it's going up and down and up and down. And it's um, what we did was we computed a safety set. Here it's an envelope that we'd like to, a flight envelope that we'd like it to stay within. So we don't want it to crash into the ceiling or crash into the floor. And so it's got an envelope in its position and velocity space so that as it approaches the ceiling, it knows that it, uh, or the floor, it knows that it has to slow down as it gets to a, um, a boundary that is, um, it doesn't violate the ceiling or the floor. So we computed that envelope and then we took the model away from the vehicle and we just left it with its envelope. And we asked it to learn a control law to follow that step trajectory. Um, and all it knows about itself is the flight envelope that we pre-computed. It doesn't have a model of itself. Okay, so what happens? The quad rotor first drops to the ground. It doesn't hit the ground because it has its envelope, its reachable set, and the control associated with that. So it knows what control to use when it hits the boundary of the envelope. So it starts sort of bouncing around the bottom of the um, of the envelope. And in doing that, it starts to learn how to raise its altitude. In particular, it starts to learn how to track the trajectory we've given it. So it doesn't have a model of itself. It doesn't have a control law, but it learns after about a minute using this policy gradient sign derivative, a very simple learning scheme, this, um, the control law to track this blue dash trajectory, which is it's the desired, that's its goal to track this trajectory. Um, and, and you see the red and blue trajectory, so, or sorry, red and green. Green indicates where it's just, you know, designing the control law. Red is when it's applying the safety-based control law so it doesn't violate, for example, the, the velocity that it has to be at as it gets near the ground. Okay, so again, it's a bit of a contrived example, but it learns safely how to, with, with the help of this reachable set envelope, it learns how to control itself just from gathering, um, gathering information about how it's flying. Okay, so it sort of populates its model and its control scheme. So we then said, well, could we take that one step further and bring it into more uh, realistic scenarios? where we'd like to use the data that it's gathering to get a better model of what's unknown about the system. So remember what we started with. We started with a differential equation model where the structure was known, but we didn't know the disturbance. So could we use this idea of learning in a reachable set context to learn more about the disturbances, the unknown behavior of the environment, the actions, that, the effect that they're having on the system? Um, and so we call this online disturbance model validation. And the idea is um, going back to the diagrams we started with in this talk, initialize the active unsafe set as the smallest candidate set. And then as you're running the system, if you get to a point where the disturbance model is violated, so there exists a disturbance such that the, um, you know, the, 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 the disturbance is outside the bound that was used to compute that initial reachable set, then, um, then grow the unsafe set or update the reachable set 
so that the, um, the disturbance that you're capturing is contained inside a new set for which the new um, uh, boundary of the reachable set, so this new level set that we've computed, contains the system safely with that new disturbance model. Okay, so this is, this is basically pictured here that at this particular point in time, we've got a disturbance measure that's outside the set that we use to compute the uh, unsafe region. So grow the unsafe region, find the smallest level set such that within that level set, you've got a safety based condition for the new disturbance that you're measuring. And, um, and then over time, as you get more and more measurements of the disturbance, you may find that you know, this set, um, or hopefully you would find that you get a better model and you're able to make that set less conservative over time. So these were maybe anomalies that you computed outside that set. And so here's again, um, this quad rotor, and we're, we're kind of uh, asking it to follow the same trajectory, a step trajectory up and down. Um, except here we're adding a big disturbance, a fan here producing a large wind disturbance in the bottom part of the room that wasn't accounted for in the original model. And, um, oops, let's just play that. Okay, so we've run two experiments um, uh, sequentially here and then we've superimposed them on top of each other. So you'll see two quad rotors. Initially, the quad rotors in the region of the room where there's no wind disturbance, but as it starts to come down, uh, it measures the wind disturbance. And so now you'll start to see this sort of separation. So the ghosted out quad rotor is not doing any online model updates. This quad rotor, the one that's not ghosted out, is following our algorithm. So it's shrunk the reachable set, in this case, the safe operating set, the controlled invariant set, so that to that level set where the disturbance at the boundary that it's measuring is commensurate with that new conservative level set. Um, and then it, you know, we can think about algorithms that start to ask it, how do we explore the boundary to ask what, what you know, is really, can we, can we get more information about what's really safe over time? Okay, so I'd like to, um, I'd like to just conclude, um, you know, we, we talked about learning in unknown environments, and this is really our current work, which is how might we gather information about the environment, about obstacles in the environment through um, perhaps a learning-based perception scheme, and then incorporate that learning-based perception into a control loop safely. And I, I don't have time to go into details here, but I'd like to just present, um, actually, I'm gonna use this architecture here, which is the idea of a modular architecture, which uses learning-based perception with a planning module and a control module, where the kind of um, Hamilton-Jacobi-based reachability is used as a safety verifier. So we're kind of um, keeping track of the actions that this learning-based scheme is providing to the planning and control. And then we're trimming off any actions which are gonna violate the safety constraints based on a model of the environment that we're gathering in real time. So with that, I'd like to just, um, I'm just gonna skip some of those last results and head to my last slide um, to summarize. So in this talk, we presented this idea of um, using information that you have about a system. So dynamics of the system, constraints about the system, and, and bringing on kind of old tools that are like Hamilton Jacoby um, from control theory, how those might be used in our modern day learning-based control to get the best of kind of the modeling control perspective while integrating learning-based schemes, like for example, um, learning-based schemes for updating the model itself, as well as learning-based schemes for uh, perceiving the environment. And, and so really kind of thinking about a blend of what we can use from control in these challenging and, um, scenarios where we need to use learning to be able to get more information about the system itself or the environment itself. 
So we're working on a lot of different questions here, like, um, you know, in a safety critical scenario, how do, what, what is the learning rate? Like, how do we update those models and those sets? Um, in particular in structured environments. So one of the questions that we're working on is um, for you know, predictive models of how the environment behaves like humans in the environment, what are methods that we could use to achieve high confidence in our models and actually using reachability for some of those. So I'd like to, um, I'd like to conclude by thanking you for listening. And I'm here and happy to answer any questions. I'd also like to thank my group, um, many who've gone on to other, many who've worked on these problems and have gone on to other positions in industry and academia, and um, many students who are still here working on these problems. It's just a pleasure working with students and postdocs on these problems. My collaborators, in particular, Alexandra Faust at Google and Jitendra Malik, a computer vision specialist at Berkeley. And I'd like to thank our funding agencies, um, DARPA, SRC, ONR, NSF, um, NASA, and then also Ford and Google and Facebook for supporting our work. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, Professor Tabi. And uh, for the audience, uh, please uh, actually submit your question in the chat channel. So I will read it, the questions. So maybe let me ask uh, the, the very first question. So when everybody else prepare their question, uh, I think this is uh, you know very, very uh, important applications, right? Because we're talking about autonomous driving, you know, in your example, you show how to apply this uh, uh, quad water. And then that's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not my own research area, but I always find that very fascinating. And I can see you use uh, actually reinforcement learning for, for that, that is one of the approaches. Uh, my question is that, uh, um, so in your model, do you treat uh, actually each of the vehicle as an independent agent or actually there's a version actually multiple agent that can work together like kind of a multi-agent reinforcement learning? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So in our work, we use uh, dynamical models for each of the vehicles or each of the agents. And then we use a game theoretic framework to model the interactions between agents. And that can range. So if all agents are cooperating with each other, that becomes more like an optimal control problem. But we can also model interactions where the agents are competing against each other. So like a zero sum game type of um, interaction. And, um, and so depending on how we encode like the optimization problem, we can have, um, or we, we can kind of encode different problems. For example, in the, um, the way we typically treat disturbances is as a, uh, a player that's competing against a control. We don't know what that disturbance is. Um, so to be safe, we're going to assume that uh, we should play conservatively against the worst possible action of the disturbance. So in general, the agents are modeled as independent uh, dynamical systems. And then the interactions between agents, we can, um, by changing the way we encode the game, um, the, whether it's a min-min or min-max um, across multiple agents, then we can encode um, different kinds of interactions between the agents. Thank you. Yes, um, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, the next question is that, uh, um, so we, you, you showed actually demo the example of using the, the wind as the disturbance. And uh, in your model, uh, in terms of the, uh, the different type of disturbance, is there any, any uh, like limit? Like how many, I mean, what are the properties that a disturbance could have? Um, uh, yeah, so we, um, we, we've modeled, um, yeah, in that example, uh, wind is one of the disturbances, um, but we've also modeled the actions of other players as a disturbance. And um, mm -hmm. uh, technically um, we can include multiple inputs, multiple control inputs and multiple disturbances. So you can model this as a multi-input, multi, um, a multi-input, multi-disturbance game system. Um, the challenge is, um, 
as you get to higher and higher dimensions of inputs and disturbances is to deal with the, um, you know, how do you solve those multiplayer games? And so in the examples that I've shown in this, uh, in, the, in the talk today, we, we have small numbers of disturbances and small numbers of inputs. Um, but the, some of the work that we're doing in my group now is really looking at expanding this to multiple players, like looking at beyond four or five players. So we had um, that multi-agent four quadrotor example, you know, that's four different agents with, um, you know, playing against each other that you saw in the talk. But, um, you know, if we're encoding this in, in autonomous driving applications where you have a driver, a car on a highway, and there's a, you know, many possible interactions within the neighborhood of the vehicle, then we want to be able to capture those interactions. So, you know, what we've been able to solve using the techniques that we're working on recently has gone up to about in the, the kind of order of 10 agents. Um, but, uh, you know, how, how to scale higher, it becomes, uh, you know, issues of solving that multiplayer game. And then, of course, you have the associated computational issues associated with the high dimensional state space, the number of states as you increase the number of players, the number of states increases. And, um, and we, we talked about the ways that we're addressing some of those high dimensional state spaces in the talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're running out of time. Uh, it's really great to have you here. So, you know, we're looking forward to hear, you know, your newest research maybe in the upcoming years in the conference. Thank you. Well, very thank much. you so much for the invitation. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.